Jason Hasty also showing uh, on the on the screen right now from the LA County uh, Office of Education. He has over 20 years of experience in education and is currently serving as the executive director for the LA County Office of Education or LACO and oversees LACO's educational programs across 18 different schools and serves a wide variety of youth. Uh, one of his schools this past year uh, was actually ranked the number one art school in the country by niche.com. And he also works closely to serve uh, incarcerated youth in two juvenile halls and five residential camp schools. He supports nine alternative sites as well uh, that serve systems involved youth, drug addiction, teens suffering from serious mental health issues, and beyond the teachers and site administrators, uh, LACO's educational programs has over 30 counselors supporting as well. Dr. Hasty has served as a teacher, dean, assistant principal, principal, coordinator, and director. And he has a doctorate from the University of Southern California, a master's from Azusa Pacific University, and he got his all bachelor's at Ball State University. We are very excited to have his talk, which is going to be called Best Practices in Counseling with At Promise Students. Uh, and please now give your full attention and please welcome Mr. Jason or Dr. Jason Hasey. Thank you. I just want to do a mic check. You guys can hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. Yep. Okay. Um, thank you to Javier and, and Council Hero. You know, they, you guys um, reached out to me over LinkedIn and um, I, I, you know, I, I've done a little research since and I'm just really, really excited about um, the mission and the vision of Council Hero in general and what you guys are trying to do. Um, and, and really how it aligns with uh, just not only what I do, but also um, what our organization does and just just um, counseling in general, and also my, more importantly, my personal story um, and how I have had my, um, you know, interactions with counselors over time. Um, you know, so I, I can just start off right now. I, I grew up in Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, I, you know, I, I will tell you right away, I was impacted by my high school counselor, um, you know, and it's, and it's amazing how one of those um, just small conversations can have negative or positive um, effects and impact on you for, for really a lifetime because I'm still talking about it. You know, I, I'm sure that the counselor that talked to me at that time did not have any idea that I would be at the age I am now in the position I am now um, still really recalling it like it was yesterday. Um, you know, and, and I, I, you know, in looking at what Council Hero, just as far as the mission, and I just can't say this, I'm, I'm looking at these words that came out. Um, we're trying to make things better, simpler, and more innovative. Um, I, I think that says it all. Um, students, uh, you know, we go back to when we were in high school and just the craziness of the moments and just the, 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 the hormones, uh, let alone the life issues. Um, the students we run across not only have um, what I call, you know, just the growing pains, if you will, but serious life issues. Um, you know, I, I've been face to face with many of my students that I just could not fathom personally going to work getting to the next step of the day dealing with the things i've seen our students deal with so you know as we look at uh the council hero mission just with better simpler more innovative i think that is key in in just the work and it really aligns with my vision as a leader um you know and, and also the other thing i, I noticed on here and, I, and again i wrote it down i want to make sure i say it just right um inner strengths interests, identity, and that, that's what we're trying to really bring out in students. You know, what are their inner strengths? Uh, what are their true, you know, their, their deep interest? And what are, what are their characteristics that give them the identity that they have? And, and do they really understand the identity? Those three things are so critical in determining the biggest one. Um, I, think, I think a counselor on a personal level, one-on-one, you're, you're, you're that person during, you know, taking that journey alongside, um, you're connecting. And most importantly, um, and I, I, this is my, my take on it. Um, I'm helping kids trying to find their calling and, you know, what is a calling? I mean, I think it, when we, we get called to something, I was called to education. Um, I, it was, I never imagined at, let's just say 17, 18 in high school that I, I was going to be doing this job now. Um, and I will say I was called to do it. Um, I know I never I didn't really want to be a principal. Um, somebody asked me to be a principal. I, did, I 
didn't really want to be a dean. I, I was asked to be a dean. Um, you know, and it's it's I think what what it's because those requests, those that calling that's happened is because um I, I was really found, you know, I really understood who I was and what I wanted. And I understood what made me happy. Um, and really it came down to the service of others and really changing the the systems that we see today, um, especially when we're talking about um, the current situations. Um, th these, are, these aren't, they're not current as of today. I think they're getting notoriety, but I noticed it when I started in 99 um, in the comprehensive schools. Um, in my intervention classes, there were more African-American kids and Latinos than my honors classes. And it was, it was, it was just not, I, I, from that time on, and, and this isn't something new. And we talk about how this really starts just at a basic level, um, you know, as far as when we talk about systems involved youth, and you're gonna hear me speak about that a little bit. Um, I, I noticed the problem back then. I noticed how schedules would just get changed based on a need for numbers. I noticed, um, you know, I, I came in as a teacher to teach a class and my rosters were just different and I didn't know why. And I had 40 plus kids who I worked hard, incredibly hard to develop personal relationships and true like deep connections with them in order to motivate them to change their outlook on life and also really to be start, starting to believe in what they could be and what they could do. And when I saw the organizational operational uh, limitations and obstacles that just came out of nowhere where my rosters change and I realized, oh my gosh, I'm nine weeks in, grades are due tomorrow, I have to make all these changes. And so, you know, it, it did make me mad. And I, I got really frustrated with the systems I have, I, I was, I was um, engaging with. And so for me, um, I, I just really took steps to get the authority to garner the power I needed to really make the change I believe needed to be made. And so I, I, I am so happy because it's been a journey. Um, I've done it with a lot of counselors. And a, and a lot of mentors to find that out, but it's really simple. You know, what was I good at? What was I strong at? What were my interests? And, 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 and who am I? And I think that's where you're gonna hear me talk about that a, a lot today. So with that said, um, USC, you heard the bio. I don't need to go into that. You can look me up on LinkedIn. I got the link right here. Um, but I do wanna kind of give you guys some technical support and I'm gonna give you um, a, a, a 20,000 foot view cause that's my position right now. Um, but really, and that, and again, back to my calling, this is what, I, what I've been trying to do. I've been really looking at these um, systems and process and just really thinking about who is journeying with a student, who is in their ear, who is meeting with them, who's engaging them, how are they doing it? And then on top of that, what is the system above the, in how can I organize the system in the best way possible to make that as effective as possible. Um, so just understand that's that's my core, that's my why. Um, I, I, I have tons of stories, you know, I have the students, I remember them by name. Um, and we're all here really to do what I said before and transform, transform ourselves or be open to transform ourselves in the hope and the effort to transform others, especially the students we serve. So Los Angeles County, slide you see up here, um, it's a beast. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, we're, we're, we're one of the largest. I mean, if not the largest, I mean, I mean right there, there's numbers. Um, I can speak to it. Um, the numbers you see here are, um, are really are 80 districts. So we have 80 different districts in Los Angeles County. Um, we have unified, we have elementary, we have, you know, we have 80 superintendents. Um, we, we call it LACO and we call it LACO, by the way, you're gonna hear me say these terms and um, feel free to jump in, Javier, if you hear me say a acronym or something, because all of us educators, we get acronym crazy sometimes. And I, I like to make sure I explain my acronyms. But if you hear me say LACO, um, we're talking about Los Angeles County Office of Education. Um, but here's just some demographics right here, LACO in, or Los Angeles County for all students in general. Um, you can see it's, it's, a, it's a large number, but the need is real. I mean, English learners, 258,000. Um, homelessness, 63,000. I mean, it's just, it's, it's incredibly um, just, it's, it's a mountain, it's, a, it's an obstacle. It, um, we have a great need um, for what counselors do and just what our staff do and our schools do to support a population um, around 10 million people. 70% 70, 70 of these students that are going to school are low socioeconomic. So uh, just keep that idea, you know, keep that in, in mind. Um, I'm gonna move on to the next slide. Um, let me see, hold on. 
Okay, so um, more specifically, I'm going to take you down. That's the wider one. We're going to go down to Lake Los Angeles County um, of Office of Education, and you'll see I put Lake a lot. Um, this is our educational programs. So just to give you an idea of what um, I am personally overseeing and working with, um, what our team does, um, we have two juvenile court schools, uh, juvenile halls, um, Silmar, one's in Silmar, one's in um, East LA, Boyle Heights area. Um, we have four probation camps. Um, on any given day, these numbers are a little um, high. Uh, the pandemic did uh, bring them down, and that is a good thing. We all, we all will agree on that. Um, but right now, we're seeing a lot lower numbers than that. But this just gives you an idea of the, the bandwidth um, of what's going through our programs. Uh, to give you an idea, you know, students, um, they, they would get arrested for a violation of some type. Um, they would be transported to our juvenile halls. Um, at that point, they will await trial. And if they are not bailed out, um, they would have a court case and then um, they may or may not get adjudicated um, or put, receive some type of, um, you know, order. Um, so we call that adjudication. And at that point, they might be uh, sentenced or adjudicated to a camp. And the camp, you know, it can be anywhere from three, six, nine months. Um, we have different types of camps. We have mental health camps. Um, we have, um, so we, we used to have work type camps. Those have changed, but mainly we're really focusing on mental health. Uh, just a big number right there. If you, we're at 95% uh, mental health referrals of our youth. So um, if you, mental health is on site, LA County mental health. And we ran that data a while back. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. I mean, 95% of the youth that are coming into our program have an open mental health referral. Um, so a juvenile hall, you can have a student that might be there for seven days. Um, we have students that are doing something called fighting fitness. The, um, they are awaiting a court case and they might have a major trial. I've had a student in a juvenile hall for up to three years. Um, we've seen kids grow up in these juvenile halls. It's, it's incredibly sad. Um, you know, we have one hall, we have a, a, what's called a compound for adult charged. Um, we have youth that are looking at lifetime sentences in our adult charge programs. Um, I've been to that graduation. Um, we've seen, we've, I've heard kids talk, um, you know, they do, they give speeches at their graduation, um, but they're looking at possibly, um, one, the one I personally remember, he was looking at 150 years. He was, um, he was just, I think he just turned 19. So just to give you an idea of the gravity of the situation and just what we're dealing with, um, you know, mentally, um, emotionally, mental health wise, um, you know, you're, you're dealing with teenagers that are on the brink, that are in legit crisis, and um, our counselors are there. We'll, we'll talk more about that to, to be in real time, nonviolent crisis intervention, support, de-escalate. Um, probation camps, a little different, smaller settings. Um, and so if they did get adjudicated again, they would have to finish a program. Um, so I'm gonna move over to the middle one. And if you see the alternative education, we do have county community schools. Students that come to these schools um, are gonna be expelled. Um, they may um, be suffering from truancy, they may be referred by a parent, or, or they may be referred by a local district. Uh, we have, you know, the students that, that go to these schools, like the juvenile halls, they're year round. Um, they, they can go, um, they can get up to, I want to say 90 credits throughout the year, so they can get credit recovery. Um, and, and within those, we also have programs for independent study. Um, and, and just keep in mind, um, you know, sometimes we have um, safety issues. We have students that you know benefit greatly from independent study. Um, however, you know they're they're in there also for safety reasons too. I mean, we, you know we have some serious um, um, concerns. We have some serious high need students. Um, and, and just to give you um, some numbers on la um, last year, you see 2020 for our, our uh, spring graduation, we did virtually. It was really uh, it was just everybody I know dealt with some graduations. I know some counselors out there had to plan some probably on this call, um, but we did have 241 who actually graduated with us. Um, and uh, that's that's the it, what we call our incarcerated alternative ed programs. Um, so juvenile court schools are what would we would see um, are run in conjunction with probation, um, juvenile health services, um, and also uh, mental health, LA County mental health. Our alternative ed programs, county community schools are run solely by LACO. We do have some partnerships here and there with community-based organizations. Um, but we're, we're really looking at trying to um, holistically help the whole child in our alternative and our juvenile court schools. I'm gonna go to the next slide. Um, we also, and, and, and this is the crazy thing I talk about with uh, LACO's educational programs. We have the spectrum over here and then we swing all the way to the other side of the spectrum. Um, we, ha we have two traditional high schools. Uh, the two traditional high schools are an international polytechnic high school out in Pomona, um, California. And then we have LOXA, Los Angeles County High School. You heard about um, 
that th this last year, number one public art school in the country among private and public. I want to be clear on that. Um, these schools um, are a totally different type of school. It's under a different, um, actually, um, even law um, called specialized high schools that um, those students would interview. Um, they would audition at LOXA and they would interview at International Polytech. Um, iPoly, as we call it, their um, is located on Cal Poly uh, Pomona's campus. And that is a 21st century learning school. And they do uh, project-based learning based on the Buck Institute model. Um, and there we have counselors and you see the graduation rates. Uh, LOXA, we call it. If you hear the term LOXA, you'll know. Um, alma mater of Josh Groban. Um, I think um, Keenan from Blackish, he's one of our alma mater. I mean, you, every, everything you see on TV, if you go turn on the TV, <laughs> you're probably going to see something that a LOXA graduate did. Um, you know, Obama Brock's uh, painting that's in the Smithsonian, LOXA graduate. Just to give you an idea of the, the level of where these students are. Um, one of the great things there, um, we did... Um, we've made some great changes there. I mean, as far as uh, transformation is concerned. Um, when I when I first started at LACO, we were at 3% low socioeconomic. We moved that up to 20%. And so we're really trying to figure out how to make that more um, accessible to, um, you know, at Promise students um, and students from underserved areas. Um, so again, we have counseling services at both of these, um, both of these schools as well. And they're more like traditional type schools. Um, and LA uh, County um, High School for the Arts, LOXA is on Cal State LA's campus. So both of those are actually co-located with a university. So that tells you a little bit about um, just our profile at, at LACO and what we're, you know, what we're working with. Um, I, now I kind of want to give you some more technical support. And this is uh, how, we, you know, how we organize the work overall. And this is also a bit about leadership. Um, I always throw out there, uh, counselors are instrumental probably some of the most instrumental, if not most um, transformational leaders on a school site. Um, and I talk about this because in some districts, they're, they're union, they might be with the union and in the other districts, they are considered uh, administrators, although there might not be supervising administrators. Um, regardless of that, I, I always talk about counselors being emergent leaders, you know, whether you have the, the legal authority to, to supervise people and write them up or whatever, um, you know, counselors, they typically don't have that authority, but they do have the sway and the influence on a school campus. So I just, I can't say that enough, the, the role of counselors. But if we break up this work and, um, and we're talking about a counseling program, um, and again, you've seen our wide array, our wide spectrum of what we're dealing with. Um, I break it down in these areas. So um, I'm going to go through these a little deeper in each, but I kind of want to give you a, um, just a little preface, if you will. So knowledge, you know, the no, the no is huge. Um, who are your students? And, you know, if you're working individually, you can use this as well. I um, mean, if you're working systematically at a district level, you can use this. But, you know, what, how are you defining the students you work with? How are you uh, creating the profiles? Um, and again, I, I have some questions down there, you know, what are their needs? Um, what data supports those needs? And then you see the second one down, plan. Um, what is your overarching plan, not just district wide, but you individually and at the site level? Like, you know, it is what you are doing and your day to day work aligned with the site, aligned with the district. So you got to make sure that plan is really clear. You know, um, if you go to the Council Hero website, you'll, you'll clearly see, you know, they have, they have their vision, their mission, and they have their objectives. They're, they're very deliberate about what they are doing on a day to day basis. So you, you as an individual, as a school site, as a district with the counseling program need to consider that as well. Um, leverage, I, I can't say this enough. This is the secret sauce. <laughs> I will tell you right now, um, you have to leverage your resources. And some of you that might be working at um, you know, the direct services level, um, this is a, a conversation you can engage in, or maybe I can just, you know, maybe you're one of those counselors that are categorically funded. And if I'm talking about categorical funding, I'm talking about federal funds, Title I, uh, Title IV, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. In California, we have something called LCFF, or the Local Control Funding Formula, which is guided by the Local um, Accountability Plan, LCAP, Local Control Accountability Plan. Um, and then, of course, um, you want to leverage with MOUs. Uh, memos of understanding might be something you need, whether it be with your collective bargaining group, the union, because um, you might have a different type of um, working conditions, and that needs to align. Those collective bargaining agreements should align with the services you're going to support at the counseling level, whether it be school-wide or individually. 
um, such as ours or other things like that. Um, other parts of those MOUs will connect with the no. You see that mental health. Uh, you got to make sure if you're going to bring in um, uh, auxiliary services, you better have some agreements in place. And those will need to be in place. You just can't let anybody come onto your site and start working with kids. So, you know, understanding the, the technical pieces are huge. And that's really the secret sauce, you know, making sure there, there's, there's funding, sustainable. And, and we're also just protecting the liability of you personally and the organization. Uh, the, the fourth one down, tools, huge. You got to have the right tools. Um, and, we'll, and we'll talk about our tools a little bit, but uh, if you don't have the right tools to do your job, you're, it's just, it's going to be a mess and people will be using the tools they need. They will get the job done, but they'll be, you, be using the tools they need. And I know this from even from the teaching experience. My background is, is teaching. Um, we didn't have a grade book. Guess what? I made a grade book or I got a grade book and I, and I used the one I could get, you know, so we, we just got the job done and we wanted to do it right. And we wanted the best we could get. Why? Because we wanted to serve our students the best we could. Um, so implementing those tools and effectively, you know, utilizing them is huge. Um, and then you get to that last part, um, organize. You know, how are you organizing your day-to-day -day work? How is the school organizing the counselors, plural, day-to-day -day work, weekly, whatever, you know, monthly, quarterly, annually? Um, you know, and also, what, is, what does the workflow look like? You know, you might have the duties here, but what, is, what does it look like from a student's perspective? When I come into the school, when I get referred to a, a service or any type of, you know, um, counselor, what's my path? What are my choices? Th those concepts need to be mapped out and everybody needs to be in agreement on what that looks like. So I'm going to go right here and you see, uh, know your students. And I, I put this quote on, it's in my signature. Um, you know, I think uh, this is a wooden quote. Uh, they don't care what you know, and you know this as a counselor, they, they, they really don't care what you know <laughs> until they know that you care. I mean, you, you, you as a counselor are the number one engaging person on that site. And I, I think um, if we cannot get a fundamental uh, collective agreement, we're all gonna have this collective agreement that we care about students and this is how we show them we care and we do it consistently and we do it equitably. Um, and, and we're doing it all the time. I mean, it's just, it, I can't say it enough. You gotta know your students, you gotta, you gotta show them that they care. And you know, not all of us are you know, interpersonal. Um, we're not all um, intro or extroverts, right? Um, some of us don't know how to build relationships. Those are actual skills, just like teaching and, and good instruction. We have skills, some people it comes naturally. So, you know, this is a piece you gotta, you gotta really focus on. You know, how are you developing those relationships? Um, so, you know, I, I want to take time too with knowing your students. If we're talking about that promise, and that's what we're focused on, because that, you know, what who are at promise students? Why don't we even call them at promise? You know, because we have a true fundamental belief as an organization, as an individual, as, as a group that, you know, they're they're gonna they're gonna get better, they're gonna be better, and we're gonna get them there. Um, we're gonna be alongside them. But you know, you knowing who they are, um, knowing their stories is 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 really huge, you know. Um, there are there are low social socioeconomic. They're they're having issues paying bills. Um, you know they they don't know how to get the services even though they've been offered. Um, but they don't have the capacity to do so. They might not have that laptop. You know you, you know they 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 have a probation officer. You know they they may have spent the weekend in jail. Um, one of my students, you know, when he didn't come to class one day, he told me. He told me, you know, I, I'm like, why aren't you coming to school? His name is Jose. I'll never forget. And he's like, because. And it was three excuses. I'm driving my mom to jail. I had to work or I was too hungover to come in. I mean, and th this was the reality. And, you know, when I heard that is my emotions overtook me, um, I did not react. And I knew I couldn't react in that moment. Um, so, you know, so understanding at Promise Youth and just the, and, and really taking a non-judgmental um, approach to it is so key um, to developing those relationships. Um, know, know their data. I mean, we, we, we do a, um, case studies. We look at students individually. I think a lot of counselors, like we're working with that kid in front of us. We, we do the case study. We know their problem because they have a, they have a case by case need. You know, they, they miss this too much of this ninth grade English class. So we have to support it in summer for this. But you know, that, that's a huge piece. Um, but you got to bring that to a, a level of triangulation and making sure that you're, that's not the only piece you're looking at. Um, so student surveys, you know, have you conducted the focus groups? Have the, uh, have you had the staff surveys? I, I'll tell you right now, counselors, um, and you, you've all had those situations. What do the staff think about your kids? You've been advocating for them, you know, and, and there are some staff that have um, a perception or just a general outlook on their students. 
And you know, and that and that comes back to that emergent leader uh, leadership. But having that data in front of you, what the you know what the complete staff looks like is key too. So uh, pay attention to the data. And I always throw this out there: if you're going to know your students, we're not looking at one piece. Triangulate, triangulate, triangulate. I, if you tell me, I talked to Johnny. Okay, what's Johnny's scores? How does he compare to the rest? I always, you know, we always got to look at three or more pieces uh, to really start making some choices or really start figuring out where we're going to go next. So triangulation is, is at minimum, the minimum thing you should be doing um, when you're really working with students. And of course, the, the big one, and I, I, I said it before, I didn't judge Jose, you know, um, he had a 30, I, I remember the day he showed up to his, my final, he showed up to my final and he had a 32% and I'm just, I, I, I laugh and we had a good relationship. And, um, and I'm like, Jose, why, why are you here? He's like, I'm like, you have 32%. And he's like, and I go, and that's all I said. I didn't say you're a bad student. I just asked why, you know, you have a 32%. We'd always have these quiet conversations. And he just looked at me like, he needed a full mustache, 15 with a full mustache. Um, and he just looked at me and he's like, hasty, I don't go to any other class. Like you're the only class I go to. And I'll never forget, like, and again, one of those times, like, oh, my gosh, you know, and I, and I realize I look back on that and reflect, um, you know, you let the data talk. Um, this isn't about you. Um, we are only coming from a place of care and support. And, um, you know, when you're not sure what to say, don't talk. Just be there. Be present. But the data is the data. Um, I know many of you have probably been yelled at. You know, you give that transcript out. <laughs> You know, that's the data. They, they, they take it out on the counselor. You know that. And they want to go talk to that teacher. They want to get the parent to call, you know. So, but we always take it back to the data, you know, and then we come back, we, we always go back to solutions. So let me, hold on a second. I'm trying to go to the next slide. Okay, there we go. So getting more technical, um, this is the planning. And I, I, I said it pretty clearly about, um, having a mission, vision, and goals. This is just an example, and I threw it up there, and, and I'll make this available. I mean, this is so basic, but um, this is something that will go in your other documents. If you guys know what WASP, your accreditation, and uh, you know any compliance things you're doing, if you're doing a school accountability report card, um, any messaging that goes on the newsletter, you know, you want to make sure you're, you're coming back to this, this mission, the vision and counseling goals. Like, what are your goals at the site level? And I want to just give kudos, our, our team, our leadership team that works with our counselors, um, I think two of them are on right now, uh, Ms. Tapal Osborne and Mr. Larry Cantor, um, you might see their names, incredible. Um, they just, you know, Tapal did really amazing work um, last, last year to just get everybody to get in a room at the site level with the, the counselors they had and develop this. Yeah, they do it in conjunction with the principal, but this is their, this is their plan. You know, what, what do we have the capacity? In? And it's an honest conversation. So I, I just can't say that enough, really considering your mission vision. Um, you see here, and I'll just read one, the vision. Um, the BJN PAU, and no one, you know, acronyms you don't need to know, but counseling team envisions an educational environment with current programs, services, and technology that prepares students to compete in the 21st century global workforce. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a surprise about this. I don't know if you've seen it already. A few years ago, the principal at this school um, was nominated and won the Region 14, whatever, you know, the, the principal of the year. And I was so happy to give that speech about the amazing work this principal, the transformation, the things they've done at the school. And guess what? This is a juvenile hall. So, uh, you know, I, I, I'm sure some of you, you might be working at the college, you might be working at, the, at, a, at a, a school that is of, you know, of great means. But, you know, this, this is, these are incarcerated kids we're planning on getting ready for the 21st century global workforce. You know, we're, we're trying to get, it doesn't matter who you are, we're going to get you to reach your academic potential. And so this is a statement, you know, um, th these counselors got together and made a statement, a bold statement, that they're going to do something. And they, they don't, their kids, yeah, they might be in a hole, they might be incarcerated, they might be in crisis, they might have mental health needs and all this other stuff. But you know what, we're going to get them ready. And so I, I think that's, that's a part of it. And that's what the plan does. It gets everybody aligned. When people get off track, we go back to it. We talk about it. So the next one, and I, um, leveraging resources, and this might get a little technical, but I just want to make sure um, if, if there's any leaders out there, um, I, I talk about this a lot. Um, we've done a lot in the last uh, five, six years. Um, we've really transformed counseling. And 
a way that I've not seen it anywhere else. I'm just going to let you know it's it's we're doing it differently than anywhere else I've seen. Um, Miss Osborne, Mr. Cantor are, are pioneers of this work. Um, they innovated in a way um, that people look to this this program and philosophy and what we're doing um, as you know the gold standard. Um, so just to give you a, a rundown, we have 34 total counselors that we're working with. Um, we break this down into different categories. Um, right now, the newest group we have are the wellness counselors. Um, Title IV, if you see that, that is a, that's funds for wellness and technology. You will get it based on your unduplicated account of low socioeconomic students. And I'm not going to go down all that, but a certain, you know, if you have students in poverty, EL, blah, 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 you're going to get a certain amount, a dollar amount. We get a lot because we obviously serve a high number of those students. Um, but we were able to uh, leverage these funds to create three wellness counselors that um, support and connect students with, um, with, with just healthy living. So they, they oversee um, what we call the CHI compliance piece, California Healthy Youth Act. It's a law. We have to teach um, um, health and sex ed at a certain level, and it's mandated by law, but they're, they're helping with that, supporting and making sure that we're meeting the compliance, but also working with the students directly. Um, but it's all about wellness, all about making healthy life choices. Um, it's all about um, providing those uh, classroom uh, meetings um, where they would push in and talk to the class um, about life choices, anything from food uh, to reproductive health, um, to just how to get services. And so we have one at each of our juvenile halls and we have one at our county community schools that uh, rotates among the nine sites. And these are led by a nurse. So it's a little different. We have we have a RN health and wellness coordinator that su supervises and works directly with these, these three wellness counselors. Um, and so again, that's title four funds. Um, the, and the other one is you'll see is um, we have 14 behavior and transition counselors. I'm gonna tell you right now, and, and that number changes, but it, right now that's where we are. Um, these are Title I Part D, and if you know what that means, that's our um, our Part D funds are, are exactly for this. You can use it to actually bring people on. Um, we have enough to fund this. Um, you know, I just to let you know, we do have about, we're roughly at around, um, right around an $8 million Title I budget for Los Angeles County Office of Education for our students. Um, but with our 14 behavior counselors, those are two um, major programs um, in, in itself. And um, uh, Ms. Um, Osborne leads those two groups. So let's just start with transition counselors. They, they've been around a little bit longer. Um, and I'm going to get more into that. But they support the transition of youth from the time they come into the hall till they adjudicate to camps until they leave. It's really simple. And I'm gonna show you a conceptual framework on that as well um, in a little bit. So they're, they're, they're really key and that's their job. We have to make sure they're, they're, they're holding their hand with that student along the way um, through the process, checking their educational needs, checking their needs just emotionally, making sure they're getting the services and also laying the groundwork, the foundational groundwork for those students who are incarcerated or systems involved. So they'll have a successful transition back to their school of origin or district of residence. So it's a critical position. Um, and we do that in conjunction with our, our other county partners like probation and, and what we call in some states, they call it secured, secured care staff. Um, the newest group we have are behavior counselors. Um, we saw about um, a year ago, two years ago, uh, California changed its metrics on suspensions. And I'm not going to get too technical on that, but the metrics did not bode well for what we call continuous enrollment year round schools, especially in incarcerated situations. Um, you know, so a student who gets suspended once um, goes into the denominator for the percentage of suspensions the same way as a, a student who may get suspended 10 times. So the problem is um, we have some facilities that students stick around for a year, you know, and, and you know, you, you get a student and this is really challenging. We'll get a student who comes from a traditional school who rarely ever went and may have been suspended 10 times. Well, they come to our, our school in a, a one year program and they get suspended once. That's an improvement. But guess what? According to the data and the percentage and the, the suspension rate, they get lumped in next to the kid that got 10 times. So, so we saw this problem because our, our suspension rates, obviously for the, the change in that metric, which is about two years ago, our suspensions went way up. Um, so we said, we have, to, we have to do something about this. So we brought in um, a new type of counseling position. Um, and I, I would equate it somewhat to um, what we'd call a dean back in the day, but it's, it's definitely not like that. I want, we want the counseling, the trauma-informed, the nonviolent crisis intervention, the de-escalation strategies in place right then and there. So our behavior counselors 
are walking the halls. They're, they're engaging in real time. They're pushing into classrooms and they're having those, those sessions with students. Um, you'll see them talking to them in the hallway virtually now. Um, even then, I, I, you'll be on a virtual uh, class and you'll see them um, um, talking to kids um, in the chat. You know, like, hey, how you doing? I noticed you're, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then they'll call them and things like that. So our behavior counselors are another big piece. That's title one. And then what I call um, our academic, and we also academic and support. I'm not going to get too uh, deep into that, but our academic counselors are what you would consider as a traditional counselor, most would. Um, and those are funded through our LCFF, which we call our general fund. And if you're in California, you might, you might um, support some of those counselors through what's called supplemental or concentration funding. And that's extra funding you get for your unduplicated or your, your poor students. We have 17 of those students, um, or 17 of those academic counselors. And again, what they're going to be doing is those, those transcript stuff. Studies. They're going to be looking, um, you know, what, what does Johnny need? What classes should I put them in? And, and then they're going to be checking the academic process. They're going to be looking at their uh, test scores. And they're going to be obviously communicating with these other counselors. Um, so so our, if, if you go to the next one, you see the four counselor assistants. Um, we also have these. These are funded through Title I. And these are classified support positions. And they're actually for the counselors. They're not at every site, but they help with um, the scheduling because um, you can imagine um, there's a lot going on. <laughs> I mean, there, these are a lot of different types of counselors with a lot of different type of work. Guess what? With the same kids. So we have to have a lot of coordination and communication. But this gives you an idea of when I talk about leveraging resources, you know, what is the need? Um, you know, I told you earlier, we had a 95% mental health, you know, that, that's the data. And, and it's, it makes sense. Well, we need to do something about it. Oh, we got money. We can use it for wellness and technology. Well, let's create something to address the mental health needs at, at our halls, which is the highest need right now. And so we, we were able to leverage that. And same thing, we had suspensions, we had issues and the transition counselors, the, the reason why is because kids were getting out of our camps and halls. And guess what? They, the schools wouldn't let them back. You've probably seen those kids yourself. You know, they come out of, of a detention camp or whatever. The, the principal doesn't want them back. So we, we created a process based on it because kids were just disappearing. They're falling through the cracks. So these transition counselors are, that's their sole function is to make sure those kids transition successfully back to the schools. Um, and, and again, you know, um, I, I just can't say that enough. So I, I, LCFF, you know, in, in part D. So again, we'll do the Q&A if you guys have any questions about leveraging resources and how we do that. But this is what the slide's about and what you can do um, with, with those fun, that funding. Okay, really quick, the tools, and I think I had 12, 15 to one. So if I go over, let me know, or and I, right now I'm on presentation mode. So uh, you might need to jump in verbally, um, Javier. Um, okay, so the tools right now, um, we're using um, ARIES um, in California. I wanna say probably 60% or more of our uh, districts are using ARIES and that's our student information system where teachers are going to take attendance. We all, I, I hope I'm not, everybody should understand. All counselors should be experts at this. They do the scheduling through this and all that. Um, the difference for LACO, and this is when I talk about the right tools, um, we have an amazing, amazing technical support group. Um, we built <laughs> we built our own database um, and it's called Educational Passport System. And right now I just have this quick screenshot and, and you'll see that it has a little passport. Um, but these these are some of the things um, um, that you'll see that if you were to log into this educational passport system. I um, mean, you also, I'm going to tell you how this interacts with other areas. So we built this because we didn't have a repository. When kids are transitioning, when kids are foster youth, you know, many of you, if you've dealt with some of our at-promise students who are coming from sometimes seven different high schools, I've seen it. I've seen seven different high schools. I know all of us probably have that have dealt with some of our, stu our at-promise students. Well, you're, you're calling districts, <laughs> you're making all these requests, it's, it's a nightmare. I mean, and then, you know, I'll never go back to uh, one of my other students. Um, um, he, you know, he was a ninth grader in one of my programs. He was a ninth grader for, for six months. Well, guess what? The transcripts came in one day. He turned into an 11th grader. It was terrible. I mean, you know, so he had all this time in my all ed program because we didn't get the transcripts. So, so this, um, what we did is create an educational, educational passport system um, to, to really remedy that problem. So all of our individual learning plans for our students are put into this, this database. And additionally, we have MOUs, back to that leveraging, MOUs with our, um, all our 80 districts um, where we can do data sharing of our students. So if you're a counselor at the local high school down the street from one of our camps or whatever, and the kid goes there, that counselor or, or whoever the person is at the site can go in and find you know, Johnny's transcripts, he finds everything they need right there. And guess what? They can see their individual learning plan that has their goals, 
what you know what conversations have happened i mean it, it's it's pretty amazing so moving on to the next slide um sorry it came out a little weird but organize the work um this is just a, a more of a working tool um you see here what we've done we we, we uh create um, clarity for our counselors. We have conversations with them. Uh, Ms. Osborne, one of my team members, did this in conjunction with the counselors. We, we really just wanted to break down the work. This is only a small part of this document. Um, if you went down, you would see weekly, monthly, quarterly. So I just want to make sure, you know, this is what I, when I talk about organizing the work, these are the duties. Like, what am, what am I supposed to do daily? And, you know, and are you really framing that for everybody? And do you personally understand? And is that something that's understood throughout the district? And then, of course, the concept, the conceptual, conceptualize the workflow. This is huge. What is the pathway? Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but this tells you, like, this is a process. I've talked about the aftercare process. And you're like, well, what the heck is the aftercare process? Well, that's that's the aftercare process. We mapped it out. Um, we know when a student arrives, when they come in. I know what that IMDT is. You, you may not, but that's a multidisciplinary team meeting. We get everybody in a room. We're going to have that meeting. We're going to talk. We're going to set goals. And then, of course, we have our transitional team meeting when the kids getting ready to transition out of a program. And you can do this at a traditional school. This is the same process that could be used if kids are going into a, a you know, college program. Um, right now, we're working um, with, with Naviance. I, you know, I noticed Council Hero has a lot of the same tools. You know, what, what's the database? Well, what's the process? Um, the other thing, too, is when students get released or, or leave, are we following up with those kids? How are we doing that? How is that documented? What is the data we're looking at? So this whole process is one. Um, I've shown you the duties, but on top of that, um, when we're talking about organizing and conceptualizing the workflow, there's also an audit to this. You know, we go back and we check: Did you actually call on the third day that student was after they were released in the 30, 60, 90 to confirm that the student was actually enrolled? Okay. Finally, I'm just going to review quickly, um, and, and again, this is for you guys to use. Um, simple. I'm going to say, you know, you got to you got to know your students. You got to you got to have a plan. It's got to be clear. All you got to leverage your resources. You got to have the right tools, and you got to organize the work. So again, I want to thank everybody. Uh, thank counselors. This is this is the month. You know, National Counseling Month. It's amazing. You guys do great work, and I want to thank uh, Counselor Hero for allowing me to talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Jason. I uh, now we have our Q and A. Uh, so make sure to drop any questions you have in the chat. Um, I do see, I did see one earlier in the presentation uh, talking about uh, mental health. So Jason, uh, you mentioned uh, focusing on, on students' mental health and, and improving that mental health and also tracking it. Uh, how do you track uh, mental health in your own, uh, in your own operations? Yeah, so right now, um, we have, we have Senate Bill 98, which has created some new legislation due to COVID, and um, we are actually having wellness checks. So we're asking um, all, like, and, and, and mainly our counselors, but we've also asked um, administrators that we do weekly checks. But however, we do have an indicator first. We're looking at attendance, and if we see attendance falling and they're not engaging, and I, I want to say um, once it drops below 60 around, per, you know, a certain percentage, we know that we need to start doing the weekly wellness check. And that wellness check might be um, checking in with the parent, the student, and they actually document that in our student information system. If you guys use ARIES, you have a module for that. And then of course we run data. We're gonna run data and reports over time to check that. Um, and we also, with regards to mental health, um, that would also uh, trigger a referral. Um, so whether you're in the juvenile halls, we have a referral, and, or if you're in county community schools, we have mental health interns through a partnership with USC, um, and we have a, a psychiatric social worker. So then they would know to start connecting them with services. Oh, amazing. Uh, it looks like uh, we don't have any more questions, but thank you so much for joining us, uh, Jason, and uh, we're going to keep this moving along. Uh, Thank you, guys.